Opening day is less than one week away, and the Orioles opening day roster is starting to take shape. So today, I'll take one final crack at predicting that opening day roster. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Orioles fans, today is Friday, March 22nd, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are going to do our final Orioles opening day roster prediction of the offseason. Opening day roster prediction 4.0 coming up on this pod. Now, there is no guarantee Today's prediction is going to be right or any more right than the last three have, but this is going to be my last crack at it. We are six days away from opening day next Thursday, March 28th. The Orioles have already confirmed a solid amount of players that will be on the roster. Brandon Hyde confirmed some names of some position players and also confirmed the entire five of the starting rotation when he spoke to the media on Thursday. So we're already getting some Easter eggs on who those 26 players are going to be that travel north to Baltimore. The other thing Hyde did tell us, though, is that it's likely that more than 26 players go to Baltimore with the Orioles. Now, when you're at home, generally, you don't have as big of a taxi squad. You might have one extra catcher in the clubhouse with you on the taxi squad. But the Orioles finish spring training games on Sunday. And then most likely on Monday, they head back to Baltimore. Opening day is not until Thursday. It sounds like the Orioles aren't going to have those decisions made by Monday. And so instead of some guys going directly to Norfolk, a couple of guys are going to still come to Baltimore as those decisions are still being made. So we're still going to have some time till we find out about this roster. And it's quite honestly likely that we don't find out until the morning of opening day on Thursday who exactly these 26 players are. But this is going to be my final attempt at predicting the roster. So let's jump into it here and begin with the hitters. Again, we've talked about it all offseason, but Brandon Hyde did confirm it this week. It'll be 13 pitchers and 13 hitters on the Orioles' opening day roster. And you cannot carry more than 13 pitchers, but you can carry 14 or more hitters if you would like to. It was always a possibility for the Orioles because they just had so many good hitters. It's something we've talked about throughout spring training. They just have more than 13 good options. How are they going to make these decisions? Who's going to be left out? And there was a chance at one point The Orioles carried 14 hitters and 12 pitchers because although you're going down an arm, the Orioles have so many off days that they only need four starters for about the first three weeks of the season. And if you're doing that, you would still have an eight-man bullpen with four starters and you could afford to carry that extra hitter. But Brandon Hyde said, we want as many pitchers as we can, want as many arms as we can early in the season. We're still going to go with 13. And honestly, I agree with that, even though... You could get by with four starters because the Orioles pitching is still behind their hitting in terms of the talent on this roster. It's better to just maximize the number of arms you can get out there and see what you have out of this pitching staff. So it will be 13 hitters. And let's start with the locks, because at this point, between what we know and what Brandon Hyde has told us this week, there's 11 locks out of the 13 spots. And of course, it's still the two catchers. Adley Rutschman, who I think will be the best catcher in baseball this year be followed by a really solid veteran backup in James McCann and probably his final season as an Oriole. His contract runs out after this year. There are other catchers in camp in the mix like Michael Perez and Maverick Handley. Those two guys are more so competing for the number three catcher role. I believe they'll be the two main catchers in AAA Norfolk to begin the year as long as Perez does accept his AAA assignment and doesn't opt out. And I do think if anything happens to McCann or hopefully not to Adley, I think Michael Perez, who's been a veteran, been around the big leagues, probably the first catcher they call up to be another backup if they need it for a week or two. So he, I would say, is number three catcher for the Orioles heading into the season. And and the amount he's played, he's played the third most catching-wise in big league camp games behind Rutschman and McCann. So that's kind of shown you that the Orioles see him as catcher number three. In terms of infielders, I've still got the six locks. Ryan Mountcastle returned from that neck stiffness to play this week. Seems like he'll be all good to go for opening day. Ryan O'Hearn, just steady as can be the breakout season last year. Andy Costco wrote a good profile of him in the Baltimore Banner on Friday. Go and check that one out about his workout routine and how he's stayed at it, being dedicated, even though he kind of finally got over the hump last year. He wants to continue to improve. 
We know Gunnar Henderson will be there. Brandon Hyde said this week that Henderson's going to be playing mainly shortstop. I think we knew that, but kind of sounded like he might play a little less third base as well than we thought. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. Jordan Westberg, we know, is going to rove around between third and second and, and get some good at-bats with this team. Brandon Hyde also confirmed on Thursday that Jorge Mateo has made the team. I know there were some people who either didn't want that to happen or didn't see that as a lock. I've been calling that a lock all offseason, and now we get the confirmation a week before opening day, especially with the Orioles moving Mateo out to the outfield this spring, having him work on it five days a week this winter, and, and really work on playing all three outfield positions. We know he can still hit lefties. The speed is game-changing, and he's still a great defensive shortstop. And the Orioles had him play a good amount of second base this spring as well, making him more versatile for this team. At that point, he was a shoe in to make this roster. And then lastly, my final lock is a guy who has caused a lot of riff, I think, among Orioles fans about what to do with this player. But it is Ramon Arias. I know the conversations are out there. You know, how does Arias fit on this team? You know, what does he actually do? Will he even get to start? You know, is he blocking Jackson Holiday? Is Jordan Westberg at worst just a better version of Ramon Arias? Like those are all questions that could need to be answered at some point this season for the Orioles. But right now, I don't think Ramon Arias truly blocks anyone. You could argue maybe Kobe Mayo, but I don't think the Orioles are really considering putting Mayo on the opening day roster. Arias is just a solid utility guy to have. He can play if you need him to all four infield positions and he plays third and second at a gold glove level. He is at worst a league average hitter. And at best, when he lifts the ball, he's he's above average out there. Now, his power went down last year, but two years ago, he flashed some power and he's a reverse splits guy, which could help. He hits righties better than lefties and you see more righties than you do lefties. He still has a fit on this roster. Does Arias survive the entire season with the Orioles? I don't think so, but he, to me, is a lock to be an opening day Oriole. He does too much for the O's. So that gives you six locks, and I think there are six other players technically in the mix in the infield. It's Jackson Holiday, Colton Wong, Nick Maton, Kobe Mayo, Connor Norby, and Tyler Nevin still in the mix. Then you head to the outfield where there are three more locks out there. We know who it's going to be. Anthony Santander, Cedric Mullins, and Austin Hayes, the three veterans who have been around for a while, seen this Orioles rebuild through, and have come out the other side stronger. That's going to be the starting outfield to begin the season. Again, you know, Hayes and, and Mullins, could, they could start losing some playing time to other guys as the season goes on, maybe, but those three are definitely on the opening day roster. And then I would say four more outfielders are in the mix for the roster. That is Colton Kowser, Kyle Stowers, Heston Kerstad, and Ryan McKenna. So that's 11 locks out of 13 spots, which means there are two openings and essentially. 10 players, I would say, in the mix for those two openings. Now, I'm going to start by knocking out two, and those two are Kobe Mayo and Connor Norby. Now, can those two make an impact for the Orioles at some point in 2024? Absolutely, they can. But I just don't see the O's putting either on the opening day roster just because of the other veterans that are up there. I think Kobe Mayo is going to be here sooner than we think, just not opening day. I think he's going to be a special player from the right side of the plate. And Connor Norby could get a cup of coffee if the Orioles need it. I just, I've said it time and time again. Like, he's a great hitter. It's fun to watch. He's really skilled at the plate. He's just so blocked right now with what he can do. I think he's just a prime trade candidate for the Orioles to upgrade the roster potentially at the deadline this year, but still really, really good depth to have. And I think he'll start the year at AAA. Then I think there's two veterans who just won't be able to overcome the amount of players in front of them. One is Tyler Nevin, who's had a fantastic spring so far. The Orioles bringing him back from the Tigers this offseason. Brandon Hyde actually got asked a question on Thursday by the media that kind of said, hey, you know, what do you think about Tyler Nevin, even though he's not going to make the roster, blah, 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 blah. And Hyde kind of shut that down and said, wait, we are still making decisions. Tyler Nevin is still in the mix for this opening day roster, and he's had a great spring. Now, that is mostly Brandon Hyde being a good player manager and saying, well, I'm not letting you say Nevin's not making the team because he's played so well and he's got a shot. All things considered, Tyler Nevin is not making this team, and Brandon Hyde knows that, but he said the right thing to the media Thursday. But what I will say is Nevin is out of options. He does have to be DFA'd. Some other team, I think, might claim him just based on how good his spring has been. There's just too many guys in front of him to get through. And then the other one is Nick Maton. I like the versatility of Maton. He can play second. He can play third. He can also play the corner outfield if you need. He's a left-handed bat. He's been around the bigs with the Phillies and the Tigers. It's just that 
when you look at what he would mostly do, which is probably play second base, the Orioles brought in Colton Wong and they have Jackson Holiday there. I would put Maton third in the pecking order behind those two guys. It's just going to be so tough for him to overcome those two that I think Maton is no longer on the list. That takes you down to six players for two spots. Holiday, Wong, Kowser, Stowers, Kerstad, and McKenna. Now, the thing I mentioned earlier about Brandon Hyde saying that Gunnar Henderson will play primarily shortstop this season, I think doesn't tell us a lot, but tells us a little bit about what the Orioles see with this roster construction. It might mean that Mateo plays less shortstop. And we knew that was going to be the fact anyway, because he was working out more at second base and working out more in the outfield. But we could see even less shortstop from Jorge Mateo. And I actually think that the whole... Henderson at short kind of bodes well for someone like Jackson Holiday because I think the Orioles would like to see Henderson at short, Westberg at third, Holiday at second in most lineups at some point early this season. I think it means Mateo will be used more maybe at second base against lefties, maybe in the outfield against lefties as well. He'll still play a little shortstop. He's very good defensively there. But I think what that tells you is, okay, the Orioles feel they have their shortstop in Henderson. Mateo can just be a backup at that position if they need him. And Mateo can help in the outfield, which tells me I've got six infield locks and four outfield locks. that The Orioles feel that they can carry only four outfielders and have Mateo be that fifth guy roving out there and then keep a seventh infielder. So to me, the two spots is one infielder and one outfielder. So you start with the infield. I mean, maybe... That throws Nick Maton back into the mix, but most likely it feels like Jackson Holiday versus Colton Wong right now. And Holiday looks ready. He's had an amazing spring. He's taking better and better at bats as the spring goes along. We know the talent is there. Number one prospect in all of baseball. He's put on strength. Andy Costco with another really good feature of Jackson Holiday and kind of his upbringing and getting here. That was in the Baltimore banner on Thursday. Make sure you go and check that one out. But, you know, the O's could say, we want him to get more AAA time, right? He only had 91 AAA plate appearances last year. They could say we want him to work on the second base defense more. You know, although he's played the position a good amount, he's still mainly been a shortstop. And when he's in the big le leagues this year, he's going to be a second baseman. And Colton Wong has been around the bigs for a while. And even though he struggled the last two years, he's kind of an easy veteran replacement for a month before you then just call up Jackson Holiday. But if the Orioles are going to move Jorge Mateo to the outfield, and go through all of this to potentially just carry an extra infielder, right? Have Mateo be that rover so that you can carry an extra player. Wouldn't they do all that to get the number one prospect in baseball on the roster instead of doing all that to carry Nick Maton or Colton Wong? It feels like they do that to get Holiday on this roster. And that's why I think Jackson Holiday is getting one of these spots and is making this opening day roster. The Orioles may hide him a little bit against lefties early, but he's going to play against righties. He's going to play some second base. He might even DH some to get him in the order, and they're going to kind of ease him in a little bit and get him ready to be an everyday player. So that basically leaves four outfielders for one spot. Colton Kowser, Kyle Stowers, Heston Kerstad, Ryan McKenna for one outfield spot. Now, I feel like Stowers and Kerstad are kind of in the same boat right now, both left-handed hitters with big power, who you don't really want to put defensively in center field. Now, Stowers in an absolute pinch, you could. Stowers played center in Thursday's spring training game. Kerstad, you're absolutely not putting in center, so that might give Stowers a little edge. But even with Kyle Stowers' amazing spring, the Orioles still see Heston Kerstad as a better hitter than Stowers is. So those two are just kind of in mostly the same bucket. For Colton Kowser, he's closer to a Ryan McKenna bucket in that while McKenna is a much better center field defender, they can both play center field. But Kowser can hit, has had an amazing spring. McKenna is more of your classic fifth outfielder. Defensive replacement, pinch runner, late in games, might get a start here or there if there's something he does well with the bat. The issue is there hasn't really been anything McKenna has done well with the bat since he came up to the Orioles in 2021. And that fifth outfielder job that's generally on most teams, that seems to be Jorge Mateo's job now. So take out Ryan McKenna. And I think the O's still want an outfielder, although they're putting Mateo in center field, still want a second guy on this team whose primary position could be center field besides Cedric Mullins. And that to me would be Colton Hauser. So at the end of the day, while I think Kerstad shows great promise and I love Heston Kerstad, and Stowers is showing promise and McKenna has been around the block with this team. I just think it is Colton Kowser's job right now. And that could change. You know, he has options. Things could change throughout the season. 
but that spot is going to Kowser. And to make these moves, the only guy you would have to add to the 40-man roster is Jackson Holiday. He's currently not on the 40-man. And the Orioles' 40-man is currently full with 40 players. However, there's a couple things they could do. One is, I mean, depending on timelines, Kyle Bradish could be placed on the 60-day injured list. And the other thing is, Tyler Nevin, Ryan McKenna, Nick Maton are all out of options. I have none of them making the team. So they would all have to be DFA'd once they don't make the roster, which would clear up three 40-man roster spots. One easily would go to Jackson Holiday. So those are my 13 projected hitters for my final projection. The catchers, Adley Rutschman and James McCann. The infielders, Ryan Mountcastle, Ryan O'Hearn, Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, Jorge Mateo, Ramon Arias, and Jackson Holiday, the seven infielders, I should say. And my four outfielders are Anthony Santander, Cedric Mullins, Austin Hayes, and Colton Kowser. So those are my 13 hitters. Now on to the pitchers coming up next. Which 13 arms do I see heading north to Baltimore? We'll get to that coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Ibotta. Now, what is Ibotta? Ibotta is one of the more intriguing sponsors we have on this show in what it can help you out with really in your everyday life because Ibotta is there and you may not even know how it can help. Now, a new year, a new season for people means resolutions for saving money. I know it's March, but some people are still keeping up with those resolutions. So stop shopping without getting anything in return. Start getting cash back on every single purchase that you make. That's right, cash back on every single purchase. And you do it with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies to toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. So join over 50 million savers that earn cash back every time they shop. The average Ibotta user earns $145 per year. And right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use code LOCKEDONMLB. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use code LOCKEDONMLB. And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. Now, you know what time of year it is. Say goodbye to the busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. They looked great yesterday. My pick in the Tennessee Volunteers. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. So we roll on to the pitching section of my fourth and final Orioles opening day roster prediction. And again, the Orioles will carry 13 pitchers on the opening day roster. And let's begin with the starters because this is no longer a projection. Brandon Hyde did announce on Thursday what his starting rotation will be to begin the season. And it's pretty much what we've thought since we learned of the injury news to Kyle Bradish and John Means. Corbin Burns will get the opening day start for the Orioles. Then Grayson Rodriguez will start game two on that Saturday. Then the Sunday start to finish off the Angels series will be Tyler Wells as the number three starter. Dean Kramer in the number four spot will pitch the first game against the Royals. And then Cole Irvin as the number five starter pitching that second game against Kansas City before it swings back to Corbin Burns. Now, it will be interesting to see what kind of timeline John Means is on. Should be on an earlier timeline, you would think, than Kyle Bradish, if Bradish can return. And also, who would be bumped from that rotation, if anyone, or if Means would return to the bullpen when he would get back? Now, the initial guess would be that Cole Irvin would go to the pen and Means would replace him, but it could depend on you know the status of those, of those five pitchers. It seems like it won't be until May, probably, that they get John Means back and fully ready to go as a starter. So we shall see, but that'll be something interesting to watch. But that's what I've been projecting anyway. But now we have confirmation 
from Brandon Hyde. And there wasn't really a lot more options once Means and Bradish went down. We talked about kind of the final guy that was out there free agency wise was Michael Lorenzen. Well, he signed a one year, four and a half million dollar deal with the Rangers this week. So he was probably that last option that I still thought the Orioles could have used. He goes instead to Texas. So there's five locks among starting pitchers. And then I think there are now six relievers that are locks, which gives us just like the hitters, 11 locks out of 13 possible spots. My six reliever locks go like this. Craig Kimbrell, maybe introducing a change up Hall of Fame closer. He's going to be in the ninth inning. Yenier Cano, the Orioles' second best reliever last year, the breakout. He's going to be a big go to setup guy. CNL Perez, I know he struggled some in spring, but he was so good down the stretch for the Orioles last year. He's a good left to have with good stuff. He's also out of options. He's getting a spot on this team. Danny Coulomb was the surprise story, maybe even more so than Yenier Cano. Maybe not. You could argue that, but still a huge surprise story in the Orioles' bullpen last year. He's locked himself down a spot. Dylan Tate, I think at this point, is a lock. I've been struggling to say that for a while because Tate missed all of last season with elbow and forearm issues, but is now fully healthy. The stuff is back. He looks like the Dylan Tate of 2022, which was a huge part of kind of the setup middle relief of that Orioles bullpen that season. He's going to be on this team. And then I think Mike Bauman is now a sixth lock. He's been great in spring training. He is out of options. The Orioles do not want to put him on waivers because they know they will lose him. They still see a lot in him. Used to be the number one pitching prospect in the Orioles system. I think Mike Bauman's done enough, although he really struggled in the second half last year and was sent down to AAA. I think he's done enough to win and lock himself in a bullpen spot to begin the year. So that gives you four righties and two lefties in the bullpen and leaves you two open spots in the pen. And honestly, at this point, I think there's really just six pitchers in the mix. At one point, we were talking like 15, 16 pitchers for a couple of spots. There's really just six guys, I think, in the mix at this point. And you could argue it's even just five. So in the mix, I would say right now, they're still in big league camp. Keegan Aiken, Jacob Webb, Julio Tehran, Albert Suarez, Brian Baker, and Jonathan Heasley. Now, I don't think Jonathan Heasley right now, who came over from the Royals this year, is on the 40-man roster, has a shot of making the team. But he is still technically in big league camp. And he is a major league potential pitcher. I mean, has been with the Royals. So I'm still going to put him on this list. But if you had me power rank like the most likely of these six, Heasley would be very much at the bottom. It's just been a tough spring. Orioles still have things they want to work out with him to try and mold him to what they saw when they acquired him from the Royals earlier this offseason. So really six, but I think we're looking at five players for two slots. Now, one really important thing to talk about here is are the Orioles going to carry a long reliever? And I thought at one point maybe they would because they brought in Julio Tehran and they brought in Albert Suarez and both were looking okay. Then I thought maybe no because, oh, you know, they have all the off days. I've actually settled in on no. I do not think the Orioles will carry a long reliever to begin the season. I mentioned the off days. The Orioles don't need technically a fifth starter until April 16th. That is the 17th game of the season. They wouldn't technically need a fifth starter until if they wanted to go with four starters. Now, they're still going to go with five, allowing those starters to still get, you know, a solid amount of rest early in the year to you know, keep them ready for late in the season. But that should hopefully mean that your starters are more rested, can get deeper into games, and maybe you wouldn't need a long reliever. And if anything were to happen, because there's so many off days, if, you know, like remember like what happened last year when Kyle Bradish in his first start of the year got hit by a line drive in the second inning, had to leave. Tyler Wells, who was supposed to be the next day starter, said, give me the ball and went in and threw five scoreless innings of relief. If the Orioles needed to do that again, if somebody got injured, had to leave a game early, they'd be more built to do it because maybe, you know, it's Tyler Wells who has to come out of the game early. Well, Cole Irvin isn't slotted to pitch for another four days because of the off days. You just go to Cole Irvin and have him give you four innings out of the bullpen and you can still survive that without a long man. So for me, that might take not just Jonathan Heasley out of the question, who was kind of taking out already, but that might take Julio Tehran and Albert Suarez both out of the question. Now, Suarez has had a better spring. Tehran, you know, more the veteran, used to be the ace of the Braves. Both definitely have a chance still of making this team, but we know it's not going to be in the rotation. It would have to be in the bullpen. I just don't see them carrying a long man. Now, hopefully both of them end up in AAA, stay with the Orioles, and stay there as depth. But I don't think Julio Tehran will. He's on a minor league deal with an opt-out that comes in next week. And there was reporting when Tehran signed that minor league deal with the Orioles that the Mets were also pursuing him. 
And the reporting was from Andy Martino of SNY is that if he didn't make the Orioles, the Mets would jump in and pretty much immediately sign Tehran potentially to a major league deal. So if Julio Tehran thinks that he has a spot on the Mets opening day roster, if he's not going to make the O's, most likely he will opt out of this deal, not go to AAA and sign with New York. So I think he's probably gone. That makes the O's probably think a little bit harder about keeping him as the long man. I just don't think they're going to do it. Suarez, however, is on a different kind of deal. I think he will end up in AAA Norfolk as depth for the Orioles. So basically, you take all those guys out. It's two spots remaining for three pitchers. Keegan Aiken, Jacob Webb, and Brian Baker. All guys who contributed for the Orioles bullpen last season. Now, Aiken and Baker do have options where Jacob Webb does not. And that will certainly factor in here. In terms of length, I would rank them Aiken 1, Baker 2, and Webb 3 in terms of the amount of length they can give you, like multiple innings out of the bullpen at any time. We know Aiken was fairly recently still a starter for the Orioles. Now, I think number one on that list is Keegan Aiken. Brandon Hyde multiple times has talked up Aiken this camp, how he's healthy after missing the entire second half of last year with that back injury. He looks even better. The stuff looks crisp. He's Results-wise, he's been great in spring training. There's still something there with Keegan Aiken. It's like that invisible fastball that just gets on hitters. And when he throws strikes, he can get a lot of outs quickly. And that's what he was doing at one point a couple of years ago. I don't love Keegan Aiken. I, I've, I've made it known on this podcast, but I think he's going to want a spot here. And I think the Orioles are going to want a third lefty in the bullpen because you traded away D.L. Hall, because Nick Vespi or Matt Crook aren't going to make the team. They're in minor league camp now. So with Coulomb and Perez, I think Aiken becomes that third lefty in the bullpen. So basically, it's Brian Baker versus Jacob Webb for that final spot. And you all know I am a big Brian Baker fan, and I think at some point he will start really contributing to this Orioles bullpen again like he did in 2022. But here's what it's going to come down to. I don't think either of them have had like a spring or an end to last season that makes you think, oh, one's way better than the other. Here's what it comes down to. Brian Baker has options, which means you can just send him to AAA without losing him. Jacob Webb does not, which means you have to put him on waivers, and most likely someone will claim Jacob Webb. So to me, that means Webb takes the final bullpen spot and Baker goes to AAA to start the year, although Brian Baker definitely will be up with the Orioles at some point this season. So those are my 13 pitchers, my five starters with Burns, Rodriguez, Wells, Kramer, and Irvin. And then my eight relievers are Kimbrell, Cano, Perez, Coulomb, Tate, Bauman, Aiken, and Webb. But here's the thing I will say. Even more likely than those being the eight, I think it's more likely that the Orioles do a Danny Coulomb style move again at some point between now and opening day. Remember last year, Danny Coulomb was told he was not making the Twins out of camp. He decided to opt out of his deal and be put on waivers, and the Orioles scooped him up for cash, and he became one of their best relievers last year. There's going to be somebody who's cut from another team right before opening day that the Orioles are going to see some intriguing data on. And to get him are going to have to guarantee him a spot on the opening day roster. But because these final two bullpen spots are in flux, they're going to have the room. And because they'll have some open 40-man spots, I mentioned with Nevin and Maton having to be DFA'd, there's going to be some open 40-man spots. I think the O's are going to make a move like that for a reliever. And I actually think my full prediction would be the eighth and final reliever is not in camp right now with the Orioles. He is with another team, and they find a guy two days before opening day. But I got to go with what we have here. So I give that final spot to Jacob Webb. So that is a look at what my opening day roster will be, my 26 players. Put in the comments right here. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles podcast on YouTube. And give me in the comments your 26 players you think are making the opening day roster. But coming up next, one more segment to finish off the pod. Just want to look at, okay, who didn't make the roster? And who of those guys I think will stick around and be depth in Norfolk and could still help the Orioles at some point in 2024? But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, which is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that plugs right into your existing TV. So whether it's opening weekend for baseball, the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have Fire TV. And Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels that delivers a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and so much more. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked them out, you should. Trust me on this. 
So to learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire TV. So we're going to finish up the pod here by just looking at the guys who did not make my final Orioles opening day roster projection and talk about who could kind of stick in this organization. I will start with the guys who would have to be DFA'd if they do not make the roster. And that's Tyler Nevin, Ryan McKenna, and Nick Maton. I think Tyler Nevin's had such a good camp and there's still such great minor league data on him that someone would claim him on waivers. I also think someone will claim Nick Maton on waivers. He hasn't really shown a lot in camp, but he's such a versatile player and has been in the big leagues for a couple of years. I think someone would take a flyer on him. I honestly don't think at this point Ryan McKenna will be claimed. I think Ryan McKenna will pass through waivers and would still end up with the Orioles. That's just my thought here. And then on the other guys, I think Albert Suarez will accept that AAA assignment because he's been with the O's system since last year. What the O's have worked on him has been good with that fastball and the other stuff. And I think he'll know that he can be a depth starter in AAA and potentially could be called on. On the flip side, as I mentioned, Julio Tehran has an opt-out, could have interest from the Mets. If he doesn't make the team, as I predicted, I think he opts out and signs with New York. And I think the Orioles do lose him. So here's kind of a projection of what I think the AAA Norfolk Tides roster looks like to begin the year. Now, they were named the best team in all of minor league baseball last year by Baseball America, won the AAA championship. They had a lot of talent. They're not going to have as much talent to start the year this year, but that's okay because a lot of that talent is going to be up in the big leagues, helping the Orioles where it matters. But generally, they go with a six-man rotation because it is a six-day playing week. You're off Mondays. You play Tuesday through Sunday. Here's my projected rotation for Norfolk. Chase McDermott, the number one starter, Cade Povich, number two, Justin Armbruster, number three, Bruce Zimmerman, number four, Albert Suarez, number five, and Garrett Stallings, the number six starter in Norfolk. Again, if the Orioles were to need a starter at some point early in the season, I do think Albert Suarez would probably be the first guy they call up, either him or Zimmerman, just because Zimmerman's on the 40 man, so he is easiest, and Suarez has the most, you know, big league appearances, and they've liked him in camp. But down the line this year, McDermott, Povich, Armbruster, I think could all contribute to the Orioles in the second half at the major league level because they are pretty solid pitching prospects. Then I would say there's probably five pitchers to watch that will be in that Norfolk Tides bullpen. Brian Baker, the interesting lefty Matt Crook, who came over from the Yankees. Nick Vespi, who did get option to minor league camp. Juan Charles, who's got great stuff, and we're we'll continuing to watch him. And then Caleb Ort, who came over earlier this offseason. All five of those guys, I think, will pitch for the Orioles at some point this year, but I believe we'll start the season in AAA Norfolk. And then to begin the year, the Norfolk lineup will not look like it did at the end of last season, but I think the most regular Norfolk lineup could look something like this. There's certainly changes in here. But I would say Connor Norby leading off and playing second base. Heston Kerstad in left field, batting second. Kobe Mayo at third base, batting third. Kyle Stowers in right field, batting fourth. Ryan McKenna in center, hitting fifth. Then maybe Diego Castillo, who came over on waivers, batting sixth and playing shortstop. Although a, a guy like Errol Robinson could certainly be in that spot. Peyton Burdick, who the Orioles got back on waivers, DHing and batting seventh. Michael Perez, I think, will be the main catcher down there, although mostly splitting with Maverick Hanley, batting eighth. And, and it could be Hanley in there because Perez could be with the Orioles a lot as the taxi squad catcher. And then Shane Fontana, kind of a more of a minor league journeyman at this point, but a guy the Orioles still like playing first base and batting ninth. And then I mentioned guys like Errol Robinson coming off the bench, and, and there'll be other guys who will make it up to AAA at some point this year who helped this team. I mean, there's guys that are still there, like Hudson Haskin and Greg Cullen will still certainly be on this team to, to hopefully help out the Tides, and then maybe the Dylan Beavers and the Judd Fabians of the world and others could get the AAA at some point this season. But that's the depth the Orioles will have down there if something happens to one of these major league players. But that'll do it for today's episode. That'll do it for this week on the podcast. This is the final week of the pod this offseason without Orioles games that matter. That's right. Next week is opening day. We are back on Monday. We will recap the last of the Orioles spring training action. Actually, a good amount of that action is on TV and on StatCast this weekend to finish off spring training. We'll talk about what we saw from there and any other nuggets we've gotten in terms of Hyde announcing bits and pieces of the opening day roster. And then we'll start really getting you ready for opening day next week. Until then, go Charleston. Go Terps. Enjoy the basketball this weekend, and we will be back on Monday. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.